So, so as uh, Manan mentioned, my research has been on uh, learning process. Uh, how, how knowledge is created, that has been my focus. And uh, I want to really, uh, you know, thank whatever, whoever, uh, that I happened to study in a design school. And I think only because I studied design that I was able to understand the real learning process of children. So what I'm now going to present to you on uh, reimagining the modern educational paradigm based on three things. One, uh, you know, all of us, our input in design education. Uh, second, uh, my research on how children learn. And third is on how actually uh, artisans and non-literate communities uh, really understand the world. So this is the, uh, has been my research. And of course, parallelly, I've also been researching on how damaging modern schooling is all about. It's cognitive damages, spiritual damages, you know, cultural damages. I mean, it's a, it's very strange that, uh, that, uh, that people have not really paid attention to this so far. Uh, you know, I mean, after uh, all this talks about critical learning and, you know, all this terminology that modernity creates, yet we get fixed onto a framework and doesn't dare to come out of that and really relook at uh, what really constitutes learning. You know? So I will uh, do a formal presentation I have prepared specially for this. So, uh, you know, let me just start my screen sharing and... Uh, Yeah. So I have also been quite interested in, you know, many, many attempts that has been happening to, to you know, to address the issue of you know, not just a regular education, but also higher education, you know. So uh, very cleanly following what has been happening, uh, you know, so, so the presentation is basically on, uh, uh, also this will be extremely, you know, important for design students because uh, I think the, the real potential of design education, if, if we are really able to address it, is for self-transformation. Other things are secondary, this is what I feel. Because really the, the, the context, the condition, the content, all that, if you can relook at it, design education premise can become a fantastic uh, uh, you know, possibility for uh, really transformation of our, uh, uh, you know, uh, for our being actually so so what i'm going to talk about is from transferring information to creating knowledge from learning the word to learning the world see this is something that i came across when i started living with rural tribal people illiterate people suddenly it stuck to me that literates learn the world whereas illiterates learn the world so this was a very very important you know shift in my perception and, uh, uh, you know, it, it really enabled me to uh, see things in a very, very different perspective. And then teaching paradigm to learning paradigm. So now my own experience, let me just give you, you know, shortly uh, about my experience. See, studying at NID was extremely important for me doing my post-graduation. Uh, till then, you know, I was in a teaching paradigm. So I distinguished between learning paradigm and teaching paradigm. Uh, and, and teaching paradigm is what we have normally, even in today's design and architectural schools, more or less it's a teaching paradigm. So it is about an expert having knowledge, transferring that, you know, that, that's a regular thing. Even now homes have been turned into a teaching environment where parents are busy teaching. Uh, NID experience at NID was fantastic. Uh, this was in 1984, 85, around that time. Uh, hardly anybody was teaching, no policing, no compulsion, but everybody was learning. So this was a fantastic kind of a environment where wherever you see, you find people who are deeply interested in something or the other. So this was my, you know, starting point for, uh, you know, a starting point where I began to really inquire into, uh, you know, what all is happening in the name of education. So let me give you a gist of what is modern education. You know, how to teach children is the question we asked. And this is a story till now, you know ready-made knowledge is being fed on to them. I would call it linguistic data and we call it physics, chemistry, different, different names. These are tag names actually. And then inputs, continuous inputs. 
and then you measure in outputs you know by various splits and then you grade them and send them to iits and nits higher the grade you go into iits then you know so this is the drama that we have been on and there is an interesting twist now in the story they have brought in artificial intelligence to replace the teachers so you know ready made knowledge digital data is is being again top down approach input and and this more alienation from life processes and this is the continuation of our question how to teach children now there is one interesting twist in the art, you know ai related field see the uh, machine learning it was approached the way we were teaching children input and output now the new challenge that have been taken up is machines that can learn on their own so actually the interesting paradox is that um, artificial intelligence is developed by learning how children learn and that is used for dumping children down you know so this is a very interesting kind of a situation i followed it up and i found that uh, in the last few years there has been tremendous research on how children learn and this is done in mit harvard and so many institutions are involved uh, and these are all collective and group work and 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 the purpose of this is not to repair schools not to create interesting schools this is only for developing artificial intelligence so i want to share a video with you uh, let me just give me one minute let me share the sound yeah Why is it refusing to move? Ah, okay, okay. One can look at the yeah. story of computer science and think we have at least three ages. One is the age of programmers. In the age of programmers, you have to pay very smart people quite a lot of money to make some system behave in an intelligent way. We are now in the age of labelers, in which you pay a lot of people not much money in order to label data. And both of them, especially this one is n going to infinity, you know, number of labeled data going to infinity. But of course, uh, you know, children don't, don't have uh, big data. Um, we really would like to to be able to show one car and one plane to a child, like we do for a child, and then they're able immediately to generalize very well. So our ideal is then going to one and to have computers that learn like children from experience. So finally, they are telling that children learn from experience. And yet our education has changed, not, not a bit we, have, we are willing to change there. So our choice is whether we should learn from AI how to teach or whether we also should learn from children how to learn. I mean, this is the, 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 the question that the so-called educator should ask now. Uh, so let's do a audit of modern education, destruction of traditional wisdom knowledge systems, destruction of knowledge creation, meaning process of creating knowledge is completely gone out. Only 10% of this educator are producing knowledge today. Uh, you know, and that too for commercial purpose, the rest are involved in distributing knowledge as a product. Total absence of existential sustainable knowledge for the well-being of life. Total alienation, destruction of sensitivity and subtlety. So this is the sum total of the result of modern education. And then there is this new nonsense that people keep talking about, 21st century skills. You know, I mean, of the same nonsense, same approach, uh, without ever considering that we are all autonomously, biologically equipped to learn. So, see, I have been involved in uh, research which is to ask this question, how children learn. So there are two paradigms of research. Whole modern paradigm, you know, which is based on, which is on which the teaching is based, schooling is based, is by researching on how to teach children. So what is interesting is that when you, the question will naturally give you the kind of answers 
So how to teach children will give you what to teach, when to teach, how much to teach, how often, all that, this is the question that will generate. Whereas the moment you ask how children learn, there's a shift in paradigm, what children learn, how they learn, what is the content, why do they learn, a completely different series of questions then turn up, you know. I wonder why we are not asking this question. Why is that all of us are only involved in finding out how to teach them? So there is a, as I told you, the studying design education was extremely important because this is what connected me. First of all, made me understand the fact that children learn and the relation I found between these two. So design education is actually learned from learning the world to learning the world, from known to the unknown, from conditioning to awakening. I'm talking about the potential. Even now, it's not being addressed. So the first thing a design education should do is to immediately learn from children what is the process by which creation of knowledge actually takes place. So this is another important aspect of design education. It actually gives an opportunity for creation of knowledge, unlike any other subjects. And of course, there's a shift in mind to body, teaching to learning, dependence to autonomy. See, the speciality of uh, design education is that it is it's experience based. Exploration is there. Creativity is there. Our senses function. We are engaging with the world and to some extent autonomy is uh, respected. And design education, I feel, is one of the, you know, the best liberal arts education in one sense, because there's a seamless integration of various subjects. Uh, you know, beauty, and again, I'm mentioning not art, science, technology, communication, software. So there is a whole possibility of design education being a key role in reimagining both the higher education and, and the regular schooling system, you know? And, and the, the, so it's like this, Ch children also, when they make sense, it is through experience, exploration, creativity, exactly what design education provides. And it's a census world and autonomy. So, and modern education is not about experience, exploration, you know, and creativity. It's about reading, reasoning, storing, storing information. It's not about census world autonomy. It's about mind, text, and authority. So I would like to, you know, uh, to the participants, just ask one or two questions. You can just hold it in your mind. You don't have to answer right now. What is the color of sky? Just imagine that and store it. What is the color of leaf? Okay, just hold that. That's it. So there is a cognitive rewiring that happens in modern education because knowledge precedes knowing. We don't create knowledge. And analysis instead of creativity, autonomy replaced with dependence, and mind numbs and distorts the senses. But uh, our design education is not really addressing any of these issues because as you can see, that the aesthetic sense that we are learning is nothing what is nothing but just the Western, uh, you know, culture produced sense of sensibilities. Design process is turned into a method. And the height of that is that today even design schools are teaching design thinking. Design thinking is actually a formula which I think should be rejected by uh, in the education process because formulas doesn't have a have any role in, in, in designers approach to, you know, creation. So this is a tragedy that is happening all over design schools. Design thinking is had got into a subject. I don't know why, because all the three years I thought you were only doing that. So I don't know why this became a suddenly a subject. So cultural Western cultural context is reestablished and fragmented and compartmentalized subjects and teaching from books quite often. So this, these are the basic issues that the, that we need to address. And I feel that foundation is that period, is that one year. I mean, it's also okay if you extend it to some more time. But this is, I think, the most crucial thing to understand, rethinking foundation because, uh, but you know, this rethinking foundation should be based on how actually children create their cognitive foundation naturally. So this has been my uh, 30 years of research as to how actually children create their cognitive foundation enable the tools that create knowledge and, and, and develop processes that, that are meant for creating knowledge. So it's a whole uh, in your, you know, a new process. Of course, this is what the uh, MIT scientists are now trying to understand. 
So the most important thing is that human beings are biologically equipped to learn the real world, create knowledge autonomously. But education makes us to depend on external authority, turn us into analysis of second-hand information. Now, what happens is that anybody who has been studying or some interest or some exposure to brain studies would know that our brain is shaped by what we engage with. So right from childhood, when we become analysis of second-hand information, our brain then gets stuck to becoming an uh, analyzer. And uh, so this is a very interesting thing. I feel that learning, again, a completely misunderstood idea. It's a two-way process, actually. Uh, I would again ask you one or two questions and then maybe later come back to that. I want to ask you who taught you cycling, who taught you how to make chapati, or who taught you swimming. Just think about this for a, for some time and then maybe, uh, you know, once the thing is over, I can explain this to you, what, what, why I ask these questions. So when we engage with the word, written word, word installs, helps, uh, develops these habits in us, which is two dimensional habits, which are, re I mean, the activity that we do is that reading, thinking, reasoning, agreeing, disagreeing, imagining, reading and more the same. So this is what we do. Creation of a virtual two-dimensional space. So we, our mindset is linear, fragmented, sequential and compartmentalized. Whereas when you engage with the real world, world demands a different cognitive system to understand three-dimensional skills, sensing, experience, alertness, observation. So there's a completely new possibility that world actually gives you. And understanding happens in self-organization Unlike what you do with word is to use reasoning to, uh, to create an illusion that you have understood. And this is actually simultaneous, holistic, multi-sensory and multimodal. So I actually came across this because during you know, the real potential in children while doing a workshop in 2003, I found that children were creating absolutely beautiful stuff uh, with no teaching at all. I mean, I never actually, right from the beginning, I have never involved in any kind of teaching. I always uh, created an environment for learning to happen. But this was absolutely surprising for me because children were actually creating absolutely beautiful stuff. Uh, you know, 10, 11, 8, 9, you know, that kind of age old children. Uh, this is what actually made me relook at them and uh, began my journey in this, you know. So let me just give you some amount of, uh, you know, some exposure to that, but we would require some amount of redefinitions. Our present definitions do not allow us to understand any of this. So bear with me, please get into this. I mean, what I mean by learning is creation of knowledge. It's not, it's not a result of teaching, but how does, uh, you know, creation of knowledge take place? And learning is a two-way process, as I told you, because what you learn in turn shapes you. And creativity, now what has happened is that creativity has been hijacked by so-called creative professions. But actual creativity is in response to the unknown. Any action that one you know, uh, does in response to unknown is creativity. Curiosity is embedded in all living beings. It's not to be given to anybody. So an interesting video that shows that every living being is curious, you know what is happening all around. So it's nothing anthropocentric, it's nothing human centric. Yeah. And questioning, again, our notion of questioning is in the realm of language. When a child touches something and respond, ex explore it, that is a question and an answer being, you know, executed. Play again has been totally misunderstood. Playfulness is the quality in children. See, this is a very interesting thing to look at how children are playful and how, what is the process of creation of toys. The child took a bite uh, of a coconut piece. Immediately, he compared that shape to the bull, uh, Nandi bull, the horns, and then he changed it to the uh, moon, the half moon. So this is a very, very interesting process of comparison of how things look alike. So this is also the principle that children use in making toys. So play is the reenactment of experience by recreating and reliving experience. So play again is totally misunderstood by modernity. And toy is the object that is used as props in the process of reenactment of experience. 
any object that has some kind of resemblance to the original object is recreated in that context. So actually, you don't, they don't need toys at all. In fact, when you give a toy, you are destroying a total natural cognitive process. This is a child one time. It was a bus. It was for sitting. You know, so the children doesn't have that fixed idea that this is a toy to be used only for this. As I told you, ready-made toys are more dangerous than schools. Imagination is another totally misunderstood idea in modernity because we read and imagine. Unlike children, children act, natural imagination is imagination of something concrete. So what we have is what I call as imaginary imagination. So this, for, these stones are imagined as their children. So the child is a concrete thing. That is what they imagine. Two cones has become an aeroplane. So what we do is that from process orientation, from creation of knowledge, from being present, by being in quality, we shift it to product orientation, belief in knowledge, absence, and quantity. So this is the gift of modernity and modern education. So I will just show you some two, three videos on how children learn. Number one is that without senses, no learning can take place. And now you can think about what sense we have used in our schools. Senses have been completely denied in our schooling paradigm. Look at the observation that the child continuously does. Child will now try to climb, but again and again going back. And this is my next video is the most important video I have. Because that is the crux of learning actually. Look at what the older child is doing and comparing. This is actually the crux of learning. Please understand this. Your whole sensorial cognitive foundation is built based on, uh, you know, comparing each and every experience. Now this child will bless you, please take, because children are our solution actually. If we understand children, we can rewire the whole system actually. Take his blessing, thank you very much. Bless all these people also who have come. Now, I would like to show you what I call as natural pedagogy. Natural pedagogy is teaching without teaching. This is another very interesting video. This is what actually happens in a rural travel area. That the adult does what they want to do. And children observe and learn. The adult has no intention to teach. That is because learning is absolutely natural. Learning is not a choice. Learning is natural. You see, children in Bangalore slums learn four languages by the time they reach four years. It's not because of teaching, because the, 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 the environment had the possibility of learning. So I would also like to know, this is also very key, important thing for a designers to understand, especially if, you know, the foundation period, because this is exactly what we engage with. Form, function, process, material, structure, relationship and context. If you actually look at whatever children do spontaneously and naturally without any help, this is precisely what children do to understand the real world. Now form, form means the way things are seen. I'm sure all of you must have done this thing, you know, when you caught the book as in, a, in your childhood, you must have kept the book like this and called it house, you know? So why do everybody does this? Second is, you know, now look at this, so interesting. I was actually working on my computer. This child came in, she saw uh, this uh, greeting card, immediately turned it into a computer, laptop. No? Immediate study of form, exploration of form. Now, this is very interesting. The, the market they had created, each and every object resembled the, the actual thing. And what was interesting was that when there was no bacon, that shape was not available, they replaced it with the flower and chili with, uh, you know, hibiscus. Another interesting way 
in which in this case they compared the comparative sizes. This is a father and mother standing and now they are lying down. Function. Function. All, I'm sure this also all of you must have done it. Put bed sheet over a table and call that this is a house. So here we are exploring the space, the function that that you know of the house, which is actually the space that it provides. And the process is how you make things. So children are constantly involved in making things. Quality. Now this is another very important thing. I'm sure all of you must have seen when children sit on a sofa, they start bouncing. Why do all children bounce on a sofa? So this is a very interesting video I came across. For this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this actually what I was telling was that on this chair, the, the, the possibility that the chair was giving was to slide. So immediately children sat on it and started sliding. Okay. So the way children are able to immediately respond to material is this what is a very, very important thing to understand. You know, see our material understanding is very, very imposed understanding. That, that's why I'm telling this. For example, when, you know, in, in, you know when you, you know, in, in, especially, you know, you look at ceramic department, almost everybody has been taught the method of doing. And it's actually teacher has given four methods and four tools and everybody is using that. But the moment you stop teaching and allow the clay to teach you how to respond, there's a completely different relationship and authenticity that you establish. And then anything and everything can become a tool then, you know, and the clay will then tell you. So I was purposely asking earlier about who taught you how to make chapati and who taught you cycling and all that. So, because normally people would say it is their father, mother, coach or somebody, somebody, you know, but look very carefully that the cycling can only be taught by cycle because the ability to balance is what is embedded in the, uh, in the cycle. So how to make chapati is taught by atta, how to swim is taught by water. Exactly like that. Learning has to be completely re-understood as a direct process of engaging with what we are learning, learning about or learning from. So structure, what I mean is that this, they establish finally, you know, now this is, this is part of the school that I, you know, three years ago that I ran a school. So by the third year, they were making double story buildings, you know, big size. And, and as I was, I was mentioning that this doesn't happen in a linear way. There's a simultaneity to many of these things. So this is interesting that this child has made his own house. The space is there, you know, exploration of material take place. So how children learn is they experience the whole and explore the parts and their natural in reintegration takes place. That's the... So I will also quickly show you uh, one of our very, very important research, which is drawing actually, the real potential of drawing. So uh, the way I look at this is that, you know, experience through playful exploration, through recreation of experience, uh, that is by what we call as play and toy, children understand the real world in terms of three dimensionality. But drawing is recreation of experience in two dimensional space. So drawing is a very, very important thing to understand in the present context of where two-dimensional experience is, is something that we are engaging every time. So this is a fantastic, uh, you know, uh, research that we did. Well, this turned out to be like that. It's not that we did any personal research. We began to study what children do spontaneously and without any help. And by decoding that, we were able to understand the real structure and the process and the method in which children understand the real world. So drawing basically is a cognitive activity. And, and you can see the, you know, the correlation in how drawing resembles, the stages in drawing resembles other developmental stages in talking, walking, you know. So basically it's an adaptive activity, which means it's a biological activity that children do, with biological element is present. So scribbling, can be called as the crawling stage of drawing or the babbling stage of drawing. And observation is, uh, you know, something that they do. So now you can see the, the progress in one line drawing to three dimensionality. 
So you can see very clear stages in this. Then from word to a story, how from when I, you know, from babbling one sound, how does it grow into, so that's exactly the same kind of approach, uh, process you can see uh, in the, but one very important thing to keep in mind is that the difference, fundamental difference between modern education and natural learning is that in natural learning, the content is always the same. The content is your experience. It is the fine tuning of your understanding uh, is what, what increases. Because the same subject, the depth and width of the same subject keep on refining. Whereas in modern education, you know, you have different, different subjects and most of it has been now forgotten also. But in this case, there is a very integral way of uh, connecting with each other. The connection is never left because we don't know what is, you know, I remember once a child was asked, what is the smallest thing? So child is then asking back, are you asking the question from a physics subject or a chemistry subject? Because both of these people have told, biology also have told what is the smallest thing, you know? So the child is in complete confusion. So now you can see how words story, how very complex things children attempt. But this is, this is because you don't interfere at all. That's a very, very important thing to, which I'm again and again stressing. Even the word art would completely mislead them because there is no concept of art in children. Art is a modern construct. The only activity children try to do is to understand the world. This is imagination. So I know so this is all very deep study. I will just give you possibility. You know, I won't take too much time exploring form, exploring process. These are, uh, you know, wiper being, being uh, you know, explored. So my redefinition of drawing is that drawing is the process invented by children as an adaptive process to make sense of the three-dimensional world in terms of two-dimensional space. This is a biological adaptation. So the less you interfere, the child's foundation would be completely, uh, you know, based on life's intent to learn, you know, life's uh, design of, of how learning should take place. Aesthetics, this is again completely misunderstood. This is a very important thing to understand because all designers and architects all over the world are making exactly the same kind of stuff because every input is from Bauhaus, Olm, or you know, a similar kind of thing. There is no authentic input in this. And the tragedy of this is that whenever we talk about authenticity, immediately we think of, uh, in the context of India, we will think of Bharata and people like that. No, I'm not talking about that also. Authenticity means right now, how do we use our senses and understand things? This is not referring some Vedas and past books that I'm talking about. Any book, any secondhand information is harmful, whether it is Veda or, you know, whether it is a Western knowledge system, because we are all capable of connecting with the same knowledge, which is existential, which is natural, which is available to us without any, any, uh, you know, any money to be paid because this, the whole role of function, the role, role of senses is to make sense. That is all what, what that is required. Of course, it requires depth. It requires a tapas-like kind of an involvement. It can't be casual. It can't be passing exam. There is no way you can understand anything from that approach. It has to be a total involvement. So aesthetic, as I told you, is a completely misunderstood one. From a biological thing, it's understood in a very psychological idea. Is the sound uh, still shared? Let me just, because I want to share one or two videos with you. So. Sometimes it stops moving. Okay. So the function of beauty is to is for internal organization and external organization. I would like to share with you one very, very interesting video. Look at this girl who is sitting there. Look at her action, what he does spontaneously. <laughs> Now, watch now. <laughs> so what is prompting her to organize this? I'm sure this is not something that teacher teaches or anybody teaches. So there is an internal need within us. It's a biological response to organize things in a certain way, but not in a mechanical way. And you can also see that even the other child took part in this activity. 
So what I am telling is that these are biological principles which we are not trying to understand. So uh, to me, composition is something when the effort in seeing is the least. When we say something is beautiful, the amount of cognitive effort on the eye is minimum. If there is clutter, it doesn't please your eye. Why, is, why are these beautiful? Because the, it's organized in a certain way in which the cognitive ease is the result. And this is another very important thing that I've been documenting. <laughs> Why is this so natural? You're not making music. Why is that when everybody does spontaneous things, why there is rhythm? I mean, I have several videos of this. I just want to, you know, some examples of this. And every sphere of life, you will see this thing, this thing kind of things getting repeated, you know, an urge for order, an urge for rhythm, which are not psychological. See, this is to be understood because modernity is responding from the mind. It's all mind's need, which neglecting the, that there is a body which is far more rooted in, in you know, and far more understanding of what, what should happen actually. So, you now these are some houses in, you know, in some tribal areas. Here, again, the difference is that we do something and think of beauty as a later, you know, thing to be added on. It's not an integral act. Again, you look at the way we have fragmented everything into, you know, beauty as a later thing, value education, which came much later. Now there is this silly term that now every designer is using. I'm purposely used telling this, you know, empathy. That's a new term that everybody is now trading. These are all trading terms. I think we should engage with it much more sincerely to understand this, you know, don't become marketeers of these silly terms that West keeps producing, you know, design thinking, critical thinking, empathy. Empathy suddenly came up, you know, just maybe six, seven years. Then everybody is on that bandwagon now. And then we also call, we are, we are greatly, you know, great culture. I don't understand this contradiction between when Indians claim they are great culture, yet do everything that the West does without any shame, just copying them. So I'm really enjoying this. Huh? Look at this. <laughs> so what is actually required is from conditioning to awakening, because all of us are potentially genuine what I mean by genius is actually to be genuine, to be original, to be authentic. This is our nature. And I'm also not talking about spirituality. This is what every child is born with. This is what most rural tribal people are. This is what most uneducated people are. It's only through education that we create all the problems in the modern world because we alienate us from our biological roots. And, and this is a very key thing to understand paradigm of the unknown and paradigm of the known, because this is a possibility that design education gives. This is the possibility of a condition of indigenous communities because there is no teaching. Two kinds of things happen. Paradigm of unknown, what gives is that unknown shapes your value system based on humility and wonder, because you don't know anything. The only thing you, you do is to just watch and the cognitive system based on senses, body and experience. And no teaching as a condition develops value system based on openness, collaboration, and cooperation. And the cognitive system based on playful exploration, discovery, intelligence, and open-ended processes and being autonomous. I think autonomy is the key word that one must understand. Without autonomy, there is no you know, human being. So just I'm kind of summing up now. Learning is natural, curiosity is life given. To learn means to create knowledge. To learn means to shape oneself. The context is the content, the world and not the word. Language is used for articulation and, and communication and not for cognition. So this is the key shift that one must understand that through language, we can only create notions, illusions about knowledge. So design education, this, you know, I think the fundamental shift that is required is from a uh, you know, it has to move into an attitude. It has to be a transformational process, not not at not as a, some theory or some uh, rule formula that one picks up. You know, so rethinking foundation is reorientation of content, process, pedagogy, and ambience. 
And from quantity to quality, unlearning, learning to see, which means you know you making use of senses, recovering your natural cognitive process, and ability to create knowledge. This is actually very very important thing to understand. How do we create knowledge? You know, and learning to be. So these are uh, you know. So all right, you can pick up this uh, if you feel like my contact and. Uh, because I'm actually quite keen that more and more people join in this exploration of uh, coming together and creating a interesting, uh, you know, uh, collaboration for really uh, deeply learning and, 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 you know, involved in many, many questions that are coming up in this process. So thank you very much. I have, you know, ran a marathon because I wanted to finish it fast so that there may be some time uh, for uh, Oh, I did a good job actually, no? 1222. Uh, sir, should we open the floor for questions? Yes, yes, uh, yes. So you, you did ask in the beginning that, uh, you know, uh, what what is uh, what is the color of the sky and uh, what is the color of the leaf? Yes, yes. You see, normally when you ask this question, yeah. uh, most educated people. I have tried it in engineering colleges, architecture, design, you know, final design. Usually all of them answer blue color. And for leaf, they give me green color. Yeah. You know, I remember once uh, we were sitting in an architectural college and uh, the open windows, you know, you can see the sky right there, but nobody was looking out. Nobody had the, you know, the blue is very clear. But you know, the same question was asked in a classroom, in a, you know, to children, about eight, nine year old, you know. So they asked back, what time of the day are you talking about? Now, an educated person, even if they're designers, they will try to become smart by telling it is some other color. They will not ask a question, what time of the day are you talking? This is a crucial difference between an educated person and children. Children are present. We are absent. We are responding from absence. We are responding from a ready-made knowledge. You know, so this is the key aspect that I, I wanted to, you know, bring out. That this being present is the is the nature of a learner. Being observant, being attentive to what is happening around, and that is the only thing that is required to be a true learner. So uh, we have received a few questions, uh, sir, if you sure uh, they must be visible to you also in the Q&A. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I've seen that. I, I, can I read and then answer? That may be better. Yes, no? sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can digital learning ever replace the physical learning? In that case, what will be the consequences? No, you see, I am not against books nor digitality. I, my primary concern is that should these tools control the way you think and you function or you should be in control? That's the simple question I'm asking. You see the text, I'll give you how the text is controlling you. As I told you, the linear sequential, uh, you know, uh, fragmented mindset comes to us because we are engaging in a linear fragmented sequential manner. So it's, it is actually the, that the structure, the nature of the text, the written text, that is now wiring the way how we should function. I tell you another interesting example. You you have traveled to Delhi. You have traveled to Kanyakumari. I'm, I'm asking the other participants also. You, you know, in down Kerala, you say na down south you have traveled, up north you have traveled. Correct? Going to Delhi or coming to Kerala. Now, for an educated person, going to Delhi or going to Kerala means either coming down or going up. Am I right? Is this the way you are constructing in your head? Is that true? So without your knowledge, you have created a virtual vertical space inside and you're not even aware of it. So actually what happens is that, uh, you know, all this cognitive, when there is a cognitive rewiring, it creates a certain kind of a matrix within you and your thought process, everything is controlled. You don't even aware of it. You're not even aware of it. Absolutely not aware. But when you're engaging with the real world, because our systems are made for that, we then uh, awaken to our possibility and then learn that. 
Now, now what happens with the text is that text has made a complete shift in the realm of language from oral and hearing. It has now shifted to eyes and hands. It's writing, reading. So it's completely shifted, which means our biology itself has changed. Now there is what, what they're telling is that literacy and all that has created a separate, uh, you know, uh, area in the brain. It's called letterbox, by the way. And it, it, its whole process is very different. That is why we have, we have, we have a, you know, a completely different approach. The whole modern people have a different beingness because they are not, uh, you know, awakened by life itself. They are awakened by a dead material called text, a frozen, ready-made book or an expert. So when you engage with the real thing, for example, when you're looking at the sky, you will never answer it, you know, because you know that question is always absurd. What is the color of sky is an absurd question, first of all, without mentioning exact time, because that presence. So, so what happens with a digital tool is that the same kind of problem then, uh, you know, happens actually. So the, the thing is that, are you, are you able to create a cognitive wiring as per nature and then use these things as your tools. It shouldn't control you. Can you now read a book? For example, how do you, how do you, how do people read? They are read, they agree, they disagree. See, the educated person doesn't know how to hold a question. They have to agree or disagree. They, they are shaped into an argumentative kind of mode. Whereas an actual inquiry into anything has no place for arguments. It is observation. True knowledge is perception. It's not arguments, but whole modern knowledge system is based on argumentative, uh, you know, this thing. So, so what text does is to completely change our uh, experience, our way of being, you know, everything has changed. So it's very important that understand all these are tools to understand the real world. See, there's a very interesting uh, Zen Quan, you know, or, or a saying that it, it's like this, you know, the finger pointing to the moon the finger pointing to the moon. So in our case, finger is the word. Moon is the world. But what has happened to modern educated people is that they are staying with the word and assuming that is the world. They have forgotten that it is about the real world that we are engaging with. But this, this judgment, uh, uh, the structuring of the brain, when it happens to a children, they are not in, in at all in a critical stage. They cannot do anything critically. They, whatever happens to them, they absorb, they imbibe and become that. So that is the, uh, natural learning, see it's like this natural learning cannot be promoted. What it means is that natural learning is natural because your eyes seeing something is not something, it's a conditional, no? You have eyes, so you see, you see? And the moment you are interested, you will see more then you pay more attention. Naturally, something begins to happen. So, say for example, that when I mentioned that children learning four languages in Bangalore slums, they are learning because there is no, uh, there is no, what you call that? Uh, nobody teaching, nobody is promoting. You know, they're just naturally paying attention to what is happening. They are not making any attempt to learn four languages. They are not in any competition. They are there in the context, four languages are being spoken. Naturally, they, they, they listen because the eyes are, you know, the ears are open. It goes in, it gets organized and it is given to you. Even organization of that input is done by our system without any effort. It's like digestion. You don't sit and digest your food, nah, doing this, doing that. No, digestion happens on its own. What you can only do is decide what should be the input. So this also to some extent, you can decide some input, you know. Once the input has gone in, then processing is done by uh, by our system, actually. Now, what is the right age to go to? You see, actually, many of these things are very short-term kinds of questions. We should, uh, of course, have an answer. We should look at it in a in a in a much more reimaginative way. See, I feel that there are two ways to approach this. One, we should look at a very long-term kind of an approach. What should really happen? Second is that we should look at it like a 
uh, uh, like a repair job that we know very well that it is fundamentally damaging. How to reduce the damage is what we can right now look at. Reduction of damage. No? So school is there. I mean, one option is don't send children to school. That's definitely there's an option, you know. But otherwise, can we engage with schools uh, to, 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 to reimagine that how do we reduce the damage? What is actually the potential of a child? You know, so, so other questions are very, you know, uh, for example, you know, now the promotion is play and toys, educational toys, you know, that is fundamentally damaged. Children doesn't need toys at all. Because children are exploring the real world through recreating various things, you know. So in this recreation, they, they take any object. This mobile can become anything, actually. It can be a child. For example, you must have seen how children use their palm as a toy. This becomes a phone, no? So children require nothing. So in order to re-experience somebody making a call, if they don't get anything, they will just use their palm as a mobile phone, you know. That's all. So children's imagination, their self self reliance, everything is being challenged. The moment you give, uh, of course, it, it actually kills the true cognitive process itself, you know. So I I have been actually talking about uh, for young adults. What is really required is to think of a new foundation kind of a program, you know, which can see. I've been in the in the last few months, you know, in this. Over time, I had to meet few Ayurvedic and, you know, homeo physicians and all that. I can see that there is so much reduction in their quality because they have all become very allopathic in their approach, you know. See, otherwise, you meet a traditional Vaidya or a, or a homeopath who has learned on his own, their ability to attend, to attend, to be observant, to be sensitive is very, very high order. Today, no, because that ability to be observant and sensitive is something that none of our educational, uh, you know, uh, place has any 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 place at all actually. So what I'm trying to say is that there is a need for, uh, you know, a, a year or two program for creating, reclaiming our foundation, foundation for learning, not for analysis, creation for uh, foundation for learning. You know exactly the way how children created their foundation based on senses. You know. But in the, in the uh, older age, of course, you will have to go through a lot of deconditioning, de-schooling, you know, to rewire your brain and to give priority to your senses and your experience and not to the information that is fed in, you know. Actually, intelligence, somebody is asking intelligence. Intelligence is a completely, again, misunderstood idea. Just remembering some silly things and doing some permutation combination, using somebody else's information is what is considered intelligent. Intelligence is nothing about this. Intelligence is your ability to create knowledge. That is what intelligence is. It encompasses creativity. It See, I have not covered many other aspects like what is abstraction? How do actually children abstract? You know? So this whole process, first of all, I don't think most educated people know what it means to create knowledge. That's the first thing. So creation of knowledge, that is where, that means how intelligently you adopt and understand things. So, see, I, I find today's tests are nothing but test to, to make uh, the tester fear more and more superior, you know. I'll give you one simple example. You know, of course, now there is no scope for this. Otherwise, I would have given this as an exercise. I give a problem, which is to use a scale and a pencil, scale, right, and a pencil to draw a circle. Right? I have given to even MTech students, huh? so it's not just kg i mean not just the 12th or first year second year design students even m tech master's students they don't do it i think the test of intelligence should be not to remember and repeat what they have you know something that is actually challenging that would take you come out of your 
uh, you know, your uh, uh, box. Think afresh. What is the right age to get children to academics? No, I, <laughs> well, this is a typical question, but uh, let me tell you that at least up to 12, 13 years, children should not be bombarded with silly theories because that is that their foundation is getting formed. But that doesn't mean that they sit and do, you know, they must have freedom and they must have an environment of doing anything that they want to do. You see, there is one very important thing that we must remember that freedom is an existential gift. Modern people have taken it over and now they are giving bits and pieces of freedom to children. You go to any, any rural travel area. Freedom is existential. A child will never ask a parent permission to do anything. A parent will have never uh, uh, distrust the child. There is no unwanted concern about the child, which means they trust life, that life will take care of it. So there is a there is a very key problem here uh, that when you want to give you know when I say for thirteen years children should be free, which also means that there has to be a fantastic condition that enables learning to take place. For for example, the children should see people doing things, not making somebody do something else, not reading books and things like that. Actual activity, do farming, do some repair work. You see, when we ran the school. Uh, for three years, I ran that school. I, we called it reimagining schools. See the and and we removed all the hierarchy from the school, eh? headmistress and peon and all that kind of strange thing that we have now in our schools. No, we we didn't have that. We found that children were uh, children's heroes were the driver, and and because the driver also could do all kinds of repair or the ayas because they had far more life skills than people like us, you know, we can only talk. But if you look at these people, any repair work, any carpentry, yeah, every activity this person could do, naturally children are drawn to these people. So when we say don't send children to school, which also means that there has to be a fantastic environment of existential freedom and the possibility of children making and doing things without the adult interference and no teaching, you know. Because that is a very key thing to understand that children are equipped to self-correct. So when they do something, they know, ah, this is not gone right, you know, so they will do it. So children actually do not compete with others. Children compete with themselves, actually. There is always a self-correction, a feeling for refinement all the time with children, you know. So if you don't interfere and, you know, that's what they will do, actually. No, reading book is not natural. See what I mean by this. I'll tell you one very interesting thing. Uh, in some of the workshops, uh, you know, some people, I've been conducting, you know, online, I mean, offline workshops earlier. Uh, so those days, uh, what, what is happening was that some people have told me that their ability was to look at the page and remember the whole thing. So they don't, they don't read line by line. You see? So these are two ways of seeing. Our natural seeing is to see, not line by line. When you look at somebody, you don't look at one eye and then eye, then the nose, then the mouth. That's not the way our eyes are functioning. Our eyes, the way eyes function is to look at the whole. That's a one, you know? So if you don't interfere with children, if you don't teach them A, B, C, D, and line by line kind of nonsense, children might pick up the ability to text at one go, because that is the nature of the eye. So the eyes, uh, so what we are actually now doing is, we are, we are making eye the tool of the mind, rather than uh, doing its physiological function. Its physiological function is to see, not to think. Now what is happening is that our senses are tools of the mind and not of the body. So reading and all these, all these things require now a deeper a revisiting of all this and see how do we, you know, make all this text and, you know, computers and all that 
into a less harmful kind of a thing. That how do we take care of our mind that we become truly, uh, you know, see this, I am, I am making fun of creative, you know, critical thinking is that for how do you have critical thinking today? This is the question that I'm asking. Ultimately, it is all somebody else's thoughts. You know, you have read 10 books about which now you're being critical. And I find that kind of critical thinking absurd, actually. Unless you are an authentic person, there is no role for critical thinking that you have seen something, that you have understood something. That should be the basis for any critical exploration, actually. So, <laughs> yeah, this is all the, you know, one thing that uh, during my education time, I never knew that there was anything called, uh, you know, dropping out or, you know, all that kind of stuff. But in fact, in five years I did engineering, I only dropped out. All the five years, somewhat dropped out only, hardly ever attended classes. It's so boring actually. And, uh, but I took one decision by the time I left. One was never to do anything that I don't like to do. Second, never do a nine to five labor job. Unless you are glued in, you really like what you're doing. Don't enter into that. Well, I don't know how many people can choose these things, but there are opportunities like this that you can decide not to go to schools, not to go to classes and create your own learning, you know, but of course, that, that requires deep commitment, uh, more resilience. You may not be able to buy your next car, you know, uh, you know, as soon as you pass out, nothing like that. It will be a very different journey. Uh, so, uh, somebody is asking, do people need to recreate knowledge that has been created, you know. You see, the biological principle is recreation of knowledge. When I say creation of knowledge, it doesn't mean that it's a new knowledge that I'm creating. I'm actually recreating knowledge. But that is how biology functions. So it's not something you have any choice about it, you know. Uh, and also, if you actually look at uh, uh, from the context of modernity, uh, what have we actually gained from any of the old knowledge? Number one, it has all made us into superstitious people. We, what we have done is that we have shifted from religious superstition to scientific superstition. This is all what we have done. We are believers of Newton and Einstein today. So there is a need for authenticity and a need for developing a creative mind. That doesn't mean that you have to recreate everything that everybody has created that you must have a capacity, that you must be a creative person. Again, I want to re, um, you know, make a very clear uh, definition that creativity is nothing to do with art and all that kind of nonsense. Creativity is something that every child is involved in when they are, for example, when the child is climbing, crawling and climbing on a chair, it's being creative. Unless the father is also teaching the child how to climb on the chair by crawling. If that is happening, no. But otherwise, every act the child does is creative. So creativity is something that when you encounter what you do not know, that you, what you naturally do. So, so this is true for every subject that we are talking about. A scientist is a creative person. Every field requires this creativity. You know? and, and our nature is that. So I think uh, we shouldn't mechanize and you know, make it into a, uh, you know, a mechanical kind of an object. No? This mind that we have. So the problem with engaging with ready-made knowledge primarily is that what are we doing with our brain? Why are we enabling our brain only to analyze somebody's information and to do, you see, that's a, the another myth I want to break now is the notion that reasoning is a very good ability. Well, that is what is getting promoted left, right and center, reasoning ability. See, reasoning ability, you can only do reasoning, you can only do when somebody gives you information. 
in fact what hinders your creativity is your over reasoning mind because you immediately want to re and what is the reasoning basically reasoning is nothing but you are concluding something that somebody has given you and and what do you do basically with reasoning somebody has given you information huh? so you have two options to store it either you do rote learning and store it or you organize that information and store it so basically what what we use reasoning is for storing information second hand information for easy recall that's all what we are doing so we are unnecessarily promoting reasoning as a great skill reasoning is required very little you know that too, we do have ability to reason otherwise i wouldn't be speaking to you with, with you know with clarity that's because reasoning is something that is inherent in me i am not you know making an effort to reason so actually integration means integration of reasoning and spontaneity that's what in a holistic person is the moment you separate this what you actually do is you kill spontaneity and you begin to use reason because spontaneity cannot it's not man marji it's not you know what you do is spontaneous no spontaneous is something that happens from you not what you feel like doing that's not spontaneous because today that is what people think what they feel like doing is spontaneity no that's not spontaneity it is when you don't when you are not there your ego is not functioning spontaneity happens uh, when you are swimming you're not planning and you know doing that when i'm speaking to you I'm, i don't have that you know planning proceeding what i'm talking to you uh, tell me ha ah, current city life is a tragedy city life is bad for children <laughs> not only city life you know so the way we have organized modern lifestyle all together is extremely bad for children nuclear family is bad for children you must live in a collective group of you know as many people as possible like children should on a daily basis see different age groups and different things that happen in Uh, in life actually see i look at when i i've been staying in villages i see this very often that you know a child at least in a way in at least in a week sees some death some birth some marriage so they actually see life actually happening you know whereas in a, in a city uh, today with one child it's it's a worst decision to have one child you know oh, because see we are all taking economic decisions we are not taking decisions that are life centric decisions what life demands if you are concerned about children then you look at what would the ch child like would they like to play with you know some dog and cat or they want more children around them so i actually would say that three children are minimum if you don't have children that's that's fine if you're worried about population then don't have children but if you want to have children have three or you at least you you know what you call that you adopt two three at least that you know but children should have more and more children around them because adults should not play with children at all this is another big tragedy that is happening today adults are now playing with children because as i am telling these are two paradigms you see i remember a, a child asking something the child had and he is asking what is in my hand and the father is getting angry you know whereas when two children do that there is no conflict child immediately knows something to respond you know so an adult and the adult is responding from a mind centric way of doing whereas when children are doing together there is some other magic that is happening you know when they point out i remember a child explaining his experience you know that these children were you know sitting on a tree and they were imagining that this was a ship that is going in the you know in the sea and while going they are telling no look there is a island there and every child is seeing it so children have a fantastic way in which so there there's hardly any conflict when somebody says this is a ship they will not say that's a aeroplane you know somehow they come together and agree that yeah this is a ship you know what these are things that adults can never you know enter the child's world is a different world and it is children who can be with them you know so the biggest danger is actually coming from the west regarding children 
because they are promoting a new category of people called play workers that's the most then you killed everything that the child has play worker and toys are the two most dangerous things that can really kill uh, childhood anyway it will come in because anyway we are copying the west left right and center so welcome play worker <laughs> that would be the end of childhood but children need autonomy that's the most important that they require and that is one thing in our discussion about democracy freedom one thing we forget and the most important thing is cognitive freedom without cognitive autonomy there is no authentic learning So oh, is all that there is some. There's, uh, hmm. there's uh, in the comment section, uh, Mani is asking, can creativity be inculcated later in life because schools uh, have a fixed sort of a structure, and uh, what sort of contribution does it make to the importance of the beginning years of life? Uh, you see, creativity, inculcating creativity, as it is being practiced today, is wrong. <laughs> because very notion of creativity has a problem again as i told you it has been hijacked by art and uh, design people architecture and all that you know and they have some strange notions about what is creativity see creativity any authentic learning is a creative process a true learner is a creative person because a true learner always exists within the paradigm of unknown uncovering known and being in no unknown is a constant process in which a, a true learner exists a true learner will never believe what that person has understood all understanding will be held as a possibility the moment you think that you have understood the story is over there then there is nothing more to explore but that is not the way a true learner engages with you know so so uh, these things will have to be understood from a very different see the the problem is that most questions are coming from the old paradigm of how to teach children you know so uh, so my answers are from the paradigm of how children learn and what should be the right kind of educate learning environment that uh, that we need what we have left right and center is teaching environment that is why so much dependence on experts and so much dependence on models you see what is happening in the western world experts experts everywhere and so much dependence and methods being created montessori method is now left right and center being promoted everywhere you know it's an actually an absurd kind of idea this senses can be compartmentalized in a natural process all senses are functioning together you now you just take one example eating a mango all your senses are present every every moment in your life all your senses are functioning maybe in some time certain senses are functioning little more some are less but everything is ready to function kind of a situation the moment you make that into compartments like the montessori methods you know then you are creating a very artificial kind of a system in the child that you attend to one attend to the next one linear you know that absolutely is not the right way at all actually right? uh right sir i i had a um question of my own if i may put forward sure sure so uh, so when we talk about mimicry or you know uh, learning from about? mimicry huh. or or uh, rather uh, you know learning from uh, observation or just being an observer of something happening around you i mean there are a lot of thoughts uh, that come across and a lot of triggers that it uh, that that 
make you want to do certain or take certain actions uh, do, do you feel that uh, the process of mimicry uh, can can also be identified uh, differently in in adults because uh, i i agree that uh, we are trying to change how children are uh, you know interacting with their environment and the education model is there but the people who are actually interacting at the end uh, with the whole education model the the grown ups i would say mm. like uh, what about them uh, you know going back to the mimicry stage yeah actually uh, i wouldn't call it mimicry uh, what i would just call is that develop you know reawaken your genuine sense back no uh, so what i was telling was that yes uh you see systematically the damages of that 12 years of 12 13 14 how many number of years that you have gone through should be addressed and and uh, you know certain there are certain mental habits cognitive habits that are wrong there are certain physiological habits that has been you know like habits na like left hand you can only do one thing similarly uh, the brain is also a physical object na so there's a physical rewiring that has happened which has created a habit of the way we engage with it. so that all this would require you know deep effort to get back uh, our real functioning of uh, you know see for example concluding whatever others are saying is a habit that has happened with the modern mind people do not know how to hold anything as a doubt either you agree or you disagree hey. you know so this is a cognitive habit established by engaging with ready made knowledge because your option is only to agree with what the teacher said so your brain is actually getting used to agreeing to what teacher says this is all what you do there is never ever in the classroom a question being held at least for a half an hour normally for a learner the you constantly hold questions you never that never get you know fully uh, concluded so the ability to hold questions as a continuous basis is something that modern educated person doesn't have so there are many many such and senses don't function at all that's why more, modern educated people are uh, all the time mentally absent no? they are physically present mentally absent all the time they never they they are always busy thinking something never never present so there are many such habits that needs to be got back so that is why i feel a new kind of foundation program is required if you really want to think of reimagining education as if we are able to create knowledge if it is still about analyzing somebody's information go ahead and continue this but if it is about creation of knowledge if it is about creation of authentic people then a, a deep transformation is required and i think design education has that potential because it actually satisfies many conditions that a child gets you know of course we have to be less uh, uh, you know authoritarian in our approach which is very difficult because you see this authoritarian approach is also something that we are not we may not we are not even aware of it because when you experience teaching in a school what you imbibe is to be a teacher number 1 also when you think you are an educated person subconsciously a feeling of superiority go, is embedded inside you so two ways that this establishes your you know strange psychological habit you know so all these things has to be very consciously addressed and uh, you know 